Everybody and welcome to our early comics review video. I'm Andy. I'm Matt. We're here with Infinity Flux Comics out of Chattanooga, Tennessee. And this is our bigger show where we show you some of the biggest and best books that are coming out this week to your local comic book store, whether it be Infinity Flux or if you shopped online with us, infinityflux.net. Uh, this is what you can expect. We like to give you a little bit of knowledge so you're better prepared when you go to pick up your comics. And this is a very interesting week. There's some uh, pretty dynamic titles. Yeah. That's the best word I can think of. It. There's a lot of number ones also. Yeah. A lot of stuff coming in from different directions. We got some new indie stuff. We got some new Marvel stuff. We got a new DC book. So uh, mm -hmm. this is a good week to head to your local comic book store. And let's get in with, I mean, I don't know how long we're going to be doing this, but... As long as it's still as exciting as it is now, we're going to get into yeah. the Ultimate Universe. Yeah, Ultimate Spider-Man number three. One of our favorites. Holy cow. There's there's a bunch of number ones this week, but that's <laughs> how good this is, is we're going to start with the number three because this continues to be phenomenal. So in this book, Ben and Jonah, they have, uh, they're have uh, they're moving into their new office for their new news organization that still doesn't have a name yet they still don't have any employees and the office is kind of a dump but it's a start yeah um peter comes in to visit and sees that they have this board up with a picture of kingpin and it's one of those that has the strings all over the place yeah. and they're trying to connect everything to everything else um he asks if he can help but you know they say well there is a little bit of a conflict of interest since you live at the Daily Bugle, or you work at the Daily Bugle. <laughs> Essentially, you're yeah, right. there with his job. Uh, you work at the Daily Bugle, and Fisk owns that. But do you know anything about this strange green armored character that keeps attacking him? And at that point, the issue cuts to this, yeah, I mean, it's Green Goblin, right? I mean, they, they said that the news has been calling this character Yeah, that's Green how Goblin. he kind of gets his name, is that's what... He doesn't call himself that. That's what everybody Yeah, has everybody calls him. So it's the Green Goblin. And we see him fighting the Ultimate Universe version of Bullseye, even though nobody calls him that yeah. in this. But it, come on. I mean, it, it's Bullseye. And he he uses, he throws weapons in a very Bullseye-like fashion. And the rest of the issue is Green Goblin and Bullseye fighting with each other. Um, and Spider-Man does get involved a little bit too. So we see a little bit of a, of a three-way fight between the three of them. Um, we uh, we learn who this bullseye is working for. We do not learn who he is. Yeah. Um, but we do learn who he's working for, kind of what his motivation is, why he's attacking Green Goblin. And I would say it's different than what I expected. It I is. expected one thing, and when Bullseye gets to talking, I went like, oh, this is... This seems to be a bigger thing than I originally yeah, thought. Yeah, and it's it's better than yeah, what I had better. imagined. They, it's a it's a better idea than what I had thought. Um, we so we like I said, we don't learn who this new bullseye is, but we do learn who the new Green Goblin is. Yeah, we won't say who. Don't worry. But I just I was surprised. Well, I was kind of surprised about who it was, honestly, and I was surprised that we've already found out now. I thought yeah. it would be dragged out for several more issues, but we do find out who it is. Um, and so, yeah, it, it, that which, and then there's something happens at the end that it just makes me want to see the next one and yeah. why that and that and all this kind of stuff. So just a really great ending. There's also a really great moment earlier in the book with Peter and his daughter, May, that, that involves his costume. You're going to mention this. Yeah. yeah um, I think that page was released online, but I won't tell you what it is just in case, but, uh, it's, it's a great hero page. It is a great hero page. Uh, yeah, there, there's there's a great moment with them where they're doing something, and then you turn the page, and there's this nice big splash page with phenomenal Marco Cicchetto art. Uh, and it's also a cool scene because it just shows how great of a father Peter is, yeah. and it makes me think we should have had this <laughs> a couple decades ago at yeah. least. So it's, I'm so glad we have it now. Just another slam bang home run phenomenal issue of amazing. Of, I'm sorry, Ultimate Spider Man. <laughs> uh, I love this one so much. Uh, so definitely don't miss it if you like the first two. The new one is out this week. So we have our A cover right there, and we got some cool variants. This is the this. yeah the Torque variant with Mary Jane. I could do with a little bit more Mary Jane in the book. Yeah, there, there's not quite enough Mary Jane. Yet, I feel like so. next issue we've seen uh, that. They're going to be going out on a dinner date. Yeah. And I really hope we get a lot of Mary Jane in yeah. that. So that's my only really criticism of the book is give me some more Mary Jane because she's great in this. So that's that's the Torque cover. 
This is the really cool uh, Manhanini cover. I really like that with Bullseye and the Shocker. The Shocker is not in this one though, so yeah. you know. But that's cool seeing them together. Every on issue that cover. they're gonna be adding a villain yeah. to it <laughs> that we've seen. And then this is the really fun Del Mundo variant. You know, because Spider Man's got to wash his his costume, right? But it's kind of a homage to Spider Man. Spider -Man Amazing Spider Man number fifty. Yeah. yeah. Although, does he have to watch that uh, Pico Tech? Is that what it's called? Like, I wouldn't think so. It, I would hope it had some kind of self-cleaning. Yeah, like, does water... As it dissolved, it would like drop all the dirt off yeah. it or something. Uh, and then here's the 1 in 25 Greg Land variant that we are selling for $25. So, yeah. Don't miss it. It's so if, good. If you take anything away from us, it's just like, be getting Ultimate Spider-Man yeah. because it's great. Okay, next up we have a really cool one. This is X-Men 97, number one. So, to coincide with the release of X-Men 97 on Disney+, Plus, which we both have watched all of and enjoy greatly, it's nice to be back to some classic feeling X-Men yep. and some classic suits, fighting some Sentinels, uh, all of that. You get some more of that in here. So, well, not as much as Sentinels, but right. <laughs> classic X-Men. So, uh, this is by Steve Fox, and Salva Espen does the art. Uh, and this is set after the last episode of the previous, the, the original series, yeah. um, but before the new series. My, my note, to, to give it a time frame, my note says that um, this, takes a, uh, this takes place about nine months before oh, episode one uh, of the animated series, I, if that's a little bit of a hint. I should have figured that out. <laughs> I should have thought about that. Um but it's set after that, and it addresses a lot of stuff. Even in the opening uh, kind of, like, paragraph about, you know, the books that they do, yeah. it kind of fills you in on, like, what happened in the last episode with uh, Xavier seemingly dying, uh, being shot by, I forgot what the... the was it Boulevard Trask who did it? I don't remember if it was Trask, uh, but it was, it was a dude um, that we ended up seeing in X-Men 97 again. But... Uh, at this point, they are uh, the X Men are mourning the death of Xavier. To to some extent, mostly they're kind of trying to pick up the pieces, mm -hmm. and no one's feeling this more than Cyclops. Uh, Cyclops has always had the, the the leadership in him and everything, and with this, he is trying to kind of not convince everybody that he's the leader, but he really wants to pull everybody back together, and he's feeling the pressure yeah. of that. The whole time. And this even uh, comes in conflict or or makes him uh, not quite as good with Jean. Uh, she has some big news for him. Yeah. <laughs> and he is so busy trying to uh, kind of reform the X-Men and do all that that uh, he does not get to hear her big news. Um, but the other thing that's happening is there's going to be a big uh, memorial kind of extravaganza mm -hmm. for Xavier, uh, which... Performing at it is going to be Dazzler. But, of course, it's the X-Men. Whenever you have a big event that's uh, mutant-focused, someone's going to try to get in there and uh, shake things up in not a great way. But this is really fun. So it's a perfect companion to the X-Men 97 series. It's also great if you just love this era of the X-Men. Other than feeling like the show, it just feels like you're reading kind of a 90s X-Men comic. Yeah. Um, the art looks... Very, very much like the show, which I thought was really cool. Mm -hmm. Espen really honed in on, especially there's one panel with Cyclops' face, and I was like, that just looks like a still yeah, from, from the, the show. show, which is awesome. Um, everyone gets great spotlight in this. Jubilee's great in this. Beast is great in this. It answers some questions that at least I had from the show about certain characters, why certain characters are there, or what they're trying to do. Um, this fills in. It just fills in a lot of the gaps that uh, have been between the two the two shows. Um, but really, really fun. Highly recommended. And uh, yeah, I, I'm I'm very pleased with you know this as a companion piece to the show. Yeah, definitely. And the show being super awesome. Yeah. And then having this to go along with it is Gambit great. Gambit Rogue have a great scene yep. here. Uh, even just very like what they would have done in the original 97 show, you see Rogue and Gambit out shopping. And it's right. like, that's totally something they would have yep. done in the show and in the 90s uh, comic series and everything. So I like a little bit more grounded X-Men. Like, you know, they're, they're not... You know, this is no Krakoa era stuff. Right. This is X-Men living their day-to-day -day stuff. Yeah. But 
We've got this awesome Todd Knock A cover, which is just so good, so iconic with all the characters there. We've got a couple of other variants as well. We have this really nice, it's better to turn on the side, Russell Dodderman variant. We've got also this Harvey variant with Rogue. There's just nothing like seeing X-Men in those suits in yeah. a comic. It I'm is, a kid again every yeah. time I see it. Yeah. All right, so next up is Feral number one. This uh, has been a much anticipated. Uh, this is from um, the team that brought you Stray Dogs a couple of years ago. Tony, Tony Fleeks and Trish Forstner and Tony Rodriguez. Um, unlike that book, however, this is an ongoing series. So Stray Dogs was a miniseries. I realize that now reading when I read the letters page. Yeah, yeah. They, they talked about like the artist is already working on the second story arc. Yeah. So it's like, oh, well, Stray Dogs was just one Yeah, Stray Dogs thing. was like five or six issues, I think. But this is going to be ongoing, which makes me wonder like, where is that story going to go? Yeah. Like, there's, I guess there's a lot that they have planned for it. So this story follows, and, and instead of dogs, like Stray Dogs does, this story follows three cats named Elsie, Patch, and Lord. And Lord they have Fluffy been... Britches. Is it Lord Fluffy Britches? Yeah, it's Lord Fluffy oh, Britches. Oh, they just called him they Lord. they just called him Lord. Okay, yeah. I remember that from the solicitation. Yeah. Um, they've been taken from their home for reasons unknown, although I think we might know, or maybe they'll they'll get into it more in the next issue. But in the middle of the trip to where they're going, the truck crashes and sort of runs off a cliff and throws the drivers out of the truck and all the cages in the back with all the cats in they all you know pop open and the the cats escape um lord disappears and elsie and path you know they're they're desperate to find to find lord and during the search they they start because they're out in the woods right they start to notice that something is a little bit off with the animals around them uh, they look a little. They've got a little bit of coming out of their mouths, and their eyes are a little bit red. Yeah. And they find the the bodies of one of the drivers, and they have like a radio on them. And you hear the voice over the radio say, "This variant is stronger than the last one." Yeah. So right then, it's like, okay, we're dealing with some kind of virus, some kind of disease. Um, the cats are able to get away from the feral animals that are chasing them and start the journey home. But again, there apparently is some kind of virus out there that already does seem to be um, affecting the animals. Like mm -hmm. there's some foxes and there's some raccoons, I think, that they come across. And maybe it makes the leap to humans. We don't know that much yeah. yet. Uh, we haven't seen that. But it does sound like there is some kind of virus or disease or something uh, or maybe you maybe just uh, mutated rabies or something mm -hmm. that is going to turn whoever gets gets it that's going to turn them feral pretty much. Yeah, it's interesting too because it there's there's a lot of character development in here without explicitly just telling you everything. Yeah. So you see, I think it's Elsie who is very uh, worried about where did Lord go, mm -hmm. and Patch is like, oh, he'll be fine. He gets He's away all home, the yeah. time. He's on on his way home. But we start seeing like there's a couple of flashbacks that are like, okay, right. this these two are really important to each other. And without just like saying all the stuff like why were they captured, all of this, they just drop hints of things. And I think that's a really fun way to build it from the characters out rather than just telling you everything. The characters are slowly kind of telling you how what's going on in the yeah. story. And I, I really like that way of storytelling. Yeah, I, I kind of wondered if maybe they were Maybe it, this is not said in the book. This is just my own speculation. But I kind of wonder if maybe this virus, maybe scientists or somebody have noticed that all, all animals are contracting this virus. So maybe they're going house to house collecting everybody's pets and hauling them away. Maybe that's why. I don't know. It doesn't say. Uh, or maybe it's just that the owners gave them up for adoption. I don't know. But, but I do see, and it doesn't say anywhere in this, that this could be. I mean, it's it's no like uh, no secret that this is kind of... It's like a little bit of a zombie story yeah. with cats. But uh, with them talking about that there might be more story arcs, I could see this like, oh, this could become like a, not necessarily post-apocalyptic, but like a, you know, they're dodging crazed animals yeah. and they're hiding under under things. And I could see this going a lot bigger uh, as it goes forward. This is a stealth intro into The Walking Dead. This is what caused it, maybe. Yeah. I don't know. That, that'd be weird, though, right? But um, Kirkman and, and one of the things is like, yep, that's it. Yep, that's it. Yeah, cats. Cats <laughs> did it. It's their fault. 
yeah, so super good. If you liked Stray Dogs, definitely pick this up. It looks the exact same. It's I mean, the cutest, like, cute cats. It looks, I think, way back when um, Stray Dogs came out, we said it looks a lot like uh, uh, Don Bluth yeah. in, like, All Dogs Go to Heaven yep. and that kind of style. Uh, but uh, this one, I don't know where the animals go when they die. <laughs> yeah, I have no idea. They, they don't go anywhere. They just stay on Earth with stuff dripping out of their mouth. <laughs> yeah. And, yeah, so super good. Like I said, if you like stray dogs, do not miss this because it is every bit as good, and I can't wait to see this story develop. So we have our A cover right here. We got some cool variants. This is a nice um, movie poster homage. What was that one again? Dawn of the Dead. Yeah, that's right. Uh, Dawn of the Dead. Just like Stray Dogs had, I think every issue is going to have an homage cover like this. There's also a blank variant, so you can draw your own feral animal. There is a 1 in 10, uh, uh, I don't know who the artist is on this one, but there's a 1 in 10 variant. That's that... the Fleeks. Fleeks, okay. Yeah. 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 So that's we're selling that one for $10. There's a 1 in 25 Sweeney Boo variant that we're selling for $20. And there is a 1 in 50. Uh, another, um, what is this one? I'm not sure what that's an homage to. That's another movie poster homage. The It looks familiar, but it escapes me. Is it maybe... Um, Texas Chainsaw Massacre? Oh, it might Maybe. be. Let it us looks know like if that you know. era. Yeah, let us know if you know for sure. But uh, another one here, and we're selling this one for $35. Super good new new book. Okay, so next up we have another one of our favorite things coming out yep. right now. This is Duke number four, the penultimate issue of the miniseries. We already know that we're going to be getting a Scarlet and a Destro miniseries coming after the Duke and Cobra Commander one ends. So just... You strap strap on get get ready for the ride because yeah. this is this is not going anywhere yep. and I think this is just getting bigger and better. So in this uh, we pick up from what happened in the last one. We have Duke Stalker, Rock and Roll Clutch, Baroness all pinned down in the pit by Major Blood's forces above. Uh, you have you had Baroness who basically had Duke in her sights, yep. being like, "Hey, this is this is you know I'm gonna make the money from this." Uh, so I'm not going to give away how they get out of a lot of that, but let's just say they're in the pit and for the most part, the pit's pretty, uh, desolate, mm -hmm. but could there be something in the, there that they use to either escape or even fight back a little bit? Uh, you'll have to read it to find out, but very, very cool. Uh, since we are so close to the end of this story, I don't want to give away too much. You do. There is a new, um, Bad guy. I, I don't know if you'd say he's a, a, a he's not a Cobra member. Uh, I guess he not yet. The the one that that's the big thing next to him. We'll, we'll mention well, yeah, it later. I don't know. <laughs> but yeah, there's one there's one that like people will know by name. Yeah. Uh, and then uh, you start seeing maybe some hints of we know that you know Destro has been kind of teased through this entire mm -hmm. thing. But uh, we're getting another step closer to some Destro yes. action by yes. the end of this. Uh, fantastic. There is a two-page spread. Let's just say if you're a fan of uh, the characters and the vehicles from the G.I. Joe line, you will be in heaven uh, mm -hmm. in this one. So I love this issue. I can't wait. I can't wait till it's over and I can just reread it from start to finish oh, without any yeah. uh, time in between issues because it's so fast-paced and fun. I'm through reading it before I even realize it. I yep. feel like the momentum of me reading it, yep. just like, oh, I'm now at the letters page. Yeah. It's like I don't want it to end, but I do want to read it all in one sitting yeah. again. And uh, yeah, it's and and by the end of it, things are things are driving towards a conclusion of this series, but yeah. definitely not a conclusion of the overall story that all of these books are yeah, telling. Yeah, and I would recommend if you don't usually read letters pages, this all the Energon universe have had very interesting letters pages because the, the creators who talk in it don't they don't spoil things. Yeah. But a lot of people ask questions about when will we see this character or you know, someone even asks like, when are we gonna get a G.I. Joe book? And some things are discussed in it, which I thought was really cool. It's a lot of cool insight to maybe yeah. what's to come. Little and hints that. and teases and stuff. Yeah. So uh yeah, just pick it up. Fantastic issue of Duke. There's our A cover. We also have this is our Bresson variant, who I believe is going to be your artist on uh, the Destro, Destro. miniseries. So, very cool one there. 
We've also got this uh, 1 in 10 boss variant, which is this part of the connecting variants they've been doing? I believe it is, yep. Yeah, uh, and we're selling this one for $10. And then we have this uh, 1 in 25 Clark variant with major blood on there that we are selling for $20. Yeah. Yeah, such a great series. Another one of my favorites, uh, Ultimate Spider-Man and Duke. There's a couple others that are just home runs every time. Transformers. Yep. All right, so next up for me is Batman Dark Age number one. Now, this is um, this is not a Black Label book, but it is definitely not in continuity. It's very much like um, Superman Space Age, the three-issue series that came out, <clears throat> I want to say it was last year or the year yeah. before, uh, written by Mark Russell, and then Mike Allred does all the artwork on this. Now, when the solicitations for this first came out, um, the solicitation for this and also... Um, the Batman First Night, mm -hmm. w that story being about Batman in his first year, set in 1939. Um, I thought these sounded very, very similar. You both kind of mentioned uh, set, uh, <laughs> set the backdrop of real, real world, world yeah. and stuff. Uh, you know, and they're both involving Batman's origin. I was like, that kind of sounds very similar to me. This is very not <laughs> similar to the Batman First Night. So if you're a little bit worried about why do we have two of the same book, these are wildly different books. Um, so this begins in 1957. Uh, well, it doesn't really begin in 1957, but it, most of it takes place in 1957 with the death of Thomas and Martha Wayne after seeing the Mask of Zorro. So we all know that story, right? Mm -hmm. However, this time, Bruce didn't go with them. Uh, and they were killed by uh, a different... Um, we don't really know who killed him, but we... It doesn't look like Joe Chill. Yeah, definitely not Joe Chill. Yeah, they're killed by, by for, a, for a much different reason. But like I said, Bruce was not with them when that happened. Uh, and they were killed so that the board of Wayne Enterprises could take over the company. Uh, because, um, you know, with their death, Bruce is set to inherit the company, but not till he's 18. And in 1957, he's probably only like uh, 12, 11, about 11 years old, maybe 10 or 11 years old. Um, so they ha he has to wait till he's 18 so he can, till he can assume the company. Um, but over the years... There were several attempts on his life by the same people because they, again, they want to take over. They want to own the company, not Bruce, when he becomes 18. Um, he also doesn't leave to study abroad to become a crime fighter as he does in regular Batman lore. He just sort of grows up in Gotham and then lives the life of sort of a, a spoiled rich kid. That kind of thing, always getting in trouble and always getting out of it, that kind of thing. Uh, the time does jump to 1963, right before Bruce turns 18. Um, and it, instead of trying to kill him, there is a different method used to prevent him from becoming the head of Wayne Enterprises when he does turn 18. And it was very, very interesting what it was. I, I wonder if it maybe means something bigger. I don't really know for sure, but I really want to see how it plays out. Um, and we also see Bruce in the year 2030, when he's old and living in a nursing home, and having problems with his memory, like not being able to remember stuff and having to write down stuff in a, in a journal. Um, but just a very interesting take on, I guess, Batman's origin. There's not, there's only a little tiny bit of Batman in this at the very beginning because it does walk through the years in real time. So like I said, he's 10 or 11 in 1957, then it jumps to 63. He's a little bit older in 2030. He's a lot older. Um, and uh, really, you know, curious to see he, this his young life is very 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 different than what we know. Yeah, I feel like I don't want to say anything against like people who wrote the solicitations for it or anything. It's like I don't feel like you fully uh, captured what this is. Yeah, because even the stuff you showed me was like there's some curveballs in here that no one would see coming. Right, like some some weird stuff and just the fact that like his it's like oh retelling the origin. It's like literally retelling doing not even retelling doing a whole new yeah. kind of origin form this is this is less of like oh we're gonna follow him year by year and yeah. more of like okay this is something new yeah it's brand new it is definitely not the origin story that we know before but it was very well done i love the art fit this like even though there's not a lot of batman in it, i was totally just enamored with watching him grow up and you know, being a spoiled kid and that kind of thing. It's just super duper good. So if you like Superman Dark Age, or Superman Space Age, or if you just like Mike Allred, or if the story sounds interesting, definitely pick this up. I highly recommend it. So there's our A cover right there. And we have a couple variants. 
This is the um, oh, Yannick Paquette and Alejandro Sanchez variant right there. And then we have the 1 in 25 Mike Allred variant that we're selling for $30 with a whole bunch of Batman in a whole bunch of different styles, too. Um, yeah. yeah. Those are always fun to kind of go through and see if you can name a lot yeah. of them. So very cool. I love Mike Allred. Yeah. Um, it's one of those, like, it's it's jarring at first when you see Mike Allred because he's such a unique style, but he's such a good storyteller mm -hmm. that you just slip right into it. Yeah, a little bit of an acquired taste, it but is. once you acquire that taste, like, you're all in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, next up, I've got a new one from Marvel. This is Jackpot and Black Cat number one. Do we know, is this like a five or six issue miniseries? Uh, probably four to five to six. Yeah, yeah I know we've seen maybe... The first, I think we've seen the first three covers yeah. at least. Um, so this is written by Celeste Bronfam and the artist by Emilio Leso. And uh, so we've seen these two kind of team up quite a bit over since Dark Web and some of that kind of stuff. It seems like Black Cat and Jackpot have been together a lot. Um, but where this comes in, they haven't been together for a little while. Um, it's been some time. And uh, one night like she does i mean you basically just see uh, felicia black cat doing a what you just assume is what she always does yeah. just a, a kind of a burglary yeah she's stealing money yeah you know. it's really fun where she's doing it yeah uh and who's involved in all of that some some uh semi-deep cut spider-man villains and all of that but uh she ends up running into mary jane who as jackpot is out there uh you know because I, I forgot what book it was where she was like I kind of want to do the superhero thing and I'm going to start patrolling. Yeah. And start doing all that stuff. Um, they kind of run into each other and I don't, I couldn't really tell like how Mary Jane really knew the reasoning, but she basically told black cat. She's like, I don't know why you're still stealing stuff. Like you have a ton of money now yeah. from, I guess their last mission together. But it turns out that uh, kind of without her knowing on black cat, Felicia's phone uh, a new app appeared yeah. called Obscura and it has kind of been texting her and blackmailing her and sending her on these missions. Uh, and at first we don't know, you know, cause you think it was a character like black hat and be like, she doesn't, you know, you can do that all you want. And she'll be yeah, like, whatever. She'll be I, fine. Whoever, I think even Mary Jane says like, well, you're going to have, you know, a room full of uh, knocked out assassins or something right. like that. And she's like, well, this time it's different. And we do end up learning why that's different. There may be not only her they're blackmailing, but there might be someone else in Felicia's life, uh, a new character that they could be using as well. Um, so they are going to kind of team up to do this. Uh, they don't really team up too much in this one, but it looks like something's going to happen that's going to pull them together. And uh, it seems like now that Mary Jane decides as jackpot she's going to get involved, uh, the tables will be turned on her. She might have uh, stuck her nose somewhere where she yeah. shouldn't have, and she might be the next target. Um, this was really fun. I really liked the art in this. I thought the art was yeah, really nice. Was uh, especially, you know, with Mary Jane, it's fun to see what power she gets. There's one time where she's... And she tries out ones, which I really like. It's not like always the first one's the right one. Yeah. She does something, she's like... Nah, I don't need this one. Yeah. And she does it again. And so you see her, she gets one power where she turns into like a, like a energy butterfly to travel. And I was like, that one's really cool. Yeah. And she gets uh, the ability to like create portals mm -hmm. um, and stuff. So that's all really fun. Uh, I don't want to give away too much about the issue because especially where it ends up is really fun. And it kind of explained the, uh, the solicitation for number two, where I was like, it eh, seems like, you know, how does that, relate to number one but now we see um so yeah i thought i thought it was pretty fun uh and if you are a fan of those characters especially i'm a big mary jane fan so it's always yeah. great to see her and stuff we have black cat or jackpot and black cat number one you read this one also yeah did you have anything to add no i mean it's just uh you know by the you said that this brings them together. It might not bring them together. It actually might make them face off against yeah, each other. Yeah, I was trying to, to figure out how to say bring them together uh, proximity-wise. Right, yeah. <laughs> yeah, but it was fun. I always like Mary Jane and Black Cat together. Yeah. Like, it's always a good time. 
Um, and you know, if you're you know wondering about that, like this time they they come together and it's not because of Spider Man and yeah. they don't talk about Peter and they don't talk about Spider Man. Like it, this is completely unrelated to that. Yeah, I think they mentioned Peter like once in a thought or something, but this is completely outside of Spider Man and Peter and all that stuff. Yeah. So we have this really nice Adam Hughes A cover, who I believe he's doing the covers for one and two. I think Phil Noto is doing number three. But uh, some great Adam Hughes covers there. And a lot of just really good covers. So we've got this Saturday Morning Adventures variant from Cheeks Galloway. Also, uh, what was funny on this, I don't know if it's ever done it before, but her when her jackpot wheel spins, um, the little symbols on there relate to what power she gets. Oh, I didn't notice that. Yeah, so there's, like, when it was the butterfly, it was, like, a butterfly something and maybe another butterfly. Hmm. And she gets a power later, and it was, one of them was a bar of gold, and the other two were um, octopi. And I was like, oh, well, those come together to make her power. Yeah, and was like, I didn't oh, even I notice didn't that. Notice they did that, but I thought that was really cool. Nice. Uh, we also have <clears throat> this uh, Yoon variant. And lastly, we have this 1 in 25 uh, Vill Villalobos variant that we're selling for at $25. All right, so next for me is Under York, number one. This is a new uh, new series from Image. This is written by uh, Sylvain Runberg and art it w by uh, Mirka Andolfo. So you know it's going to look really good. Now, this is centered around a young woman named Allison. She, uh, she works in a food truck by day, but she's really a, kind of a struggling artist. She's preparing for her first exhibit. She's really stressed out about it, but she's also a witch. And uh, she's been- <laughs> in it, dubs, she's a witch. Yeah, <laughs> and it's not one of those where, oh, because I, I thought it was gonna be like, oh, she by the end of the issue, she discovers that she's a witch and is part of this thing. No, she already knows she's a witch. She mm. already knows how to be a witch and that kind of thing, but that's not what she does. She's an artist. That's, that's who she really is. Um, and during her first exhibit, she finally gets put together another powerful sorcerer attacks and she tries to fend him off but he's more powerful than she is and she can't do it and he you know kind of takes her out and he takes her to this place called under york which kind of looks there's there's this nice like really wide shot of the whole place and it kind of looks like this magical fantasy land but it's all underneath new york and it's and it's not just like a building it's like a whole like city under there um, and it's ruled by these all these several magical clans that kind of sit at like they're like this uh, this cabal that sort of uh, rule this place, and they don't really seem like they're bad. I don't know if they might end up being, but they seem like they're all right people. Um, but you know they're but they did have to sort of force her to come there, so maybe they're not so great. Um, but they sort of rule this magic place, and they're like the heads of all these different families essentially. And they tell her about this powerful demon that has been summoned, and that it's up to her to stop it. And she's like, well, I, you know, how do you expect me to do that? I, you know, I'm a witch, but I'm not that great at it. And I'm just an artist. I'm just trying to do my own thing up there in New York. And so, yeah, she's going to have to sort of use her witch powers to kind of uh, take down this demon. Um, there was some really cool, uh, the, there was like some cool action in this and like the way she uses her, her magic kind of reminded me of how maybe like Scarlet Witch will do, yeah. you know, she'll like cast a spell and a thing happens and. That was actually pretty neat, and I like the artwork in this. Mirka Andolfo was great. So, yeah, just a cool new you know story about witches and demons and supernatural stuff. If you're into that, you know I think you'll probably like this. So we have this A cover right here, and I do believe that's the only one. I don't even know if there were any variants. I don't, remember. I don't think there was a variant for this. Yeah, so uh, if there were, maybe we got one, but they're already filled in a pull box or something. But that's the uh, this is the one we have available right there. You can't go wrong with Mirka and Dolfo's art. Yeah, so, yeah, it so looks really good. good, yeah. Okay, next up, I've got a really cool one. This is Sam and Twitch Case Files, number one. So, uh, this is by Todd McFarlane, of course, and uh, Simone uh, Kredansky. And I just want to say at the beginning, this is a two ninety nine book. Yep. Still hold into that two ninety nine thing. Uh, I think, you know, he does that unless it's like an oversized mm -hmm. issue. But, but even then, it's only like three ninety nine. Yeah, yeah, but for a number one, a two ninety nine, number one, I think that's super smart. Uh, you know, it's kind of now like an afterthought to throw it on your pile to be like, I'll try it out. Yeah. Um. So going to this, I didn't quite know. I know there's been an old Sam and Twitch series. Uh, I have not read. I've pretty much only read Spawn and Spawn uh, related titles. 
I like Sam and Twitch, but you know, when there's a Sam and Twitch thing, you're like, well, I kind of just want to read Spawn. Yeah. So going to this, I don't want to say I had, uh, you know, uh, a bad, bad feelings about it, but I was like, oh, I hope Spawn shows up. But let me just say, all I had to say, like, I really enjoyed this, and Spawn is not in it. Uh, you can kind of see him there on the cover, and of course, it's very much in the Spawn world where tonally and everything, uh, very much like that. But uh, this takes place kind of, I guess. Since they don't mention Spawn, I guess it takes place currently in the Spawn universe, but it could just kind of be its own side thing. Yeah. But if you're familiar with Sam and Twitch, they're partners. Uh, it, they're, they're, I guess they're detectives that work for the police department, that kind of thing. Um, but you are jumping back in with them quite a few years into their career. And they're you, you've got kind of Sam, who's like the the big guy and he's kind of rough around the edges and he's always smoking and he's, <laughs> you know, and then you've got Twitch who's, uh, the smaller guy, he's a family man. Uh, and they kind of play off of each other. Uh, and in this Sam is on a case and he has kind of, uh, uh, to get information about something going on. He kind of has these punk kids, uh, that are working for the police department, working for him. And they're supposed to like relay information to him. Uh, but they're just kind of local kids, and they're really funny. They because they're like you're like wondering what they're talking about right at the beginning, and you realize they're just like talking smack about Mario Kart. Oh yeah, about each other. Like oh well, you know Toad's known to do that. <laughs> and that was really fun. But uh, Sam stops him and is like, "You did not follow through on what we talked about," and the guy's like, "I'm sorry. You know it's a tough situation, or whatever." And Sam pretty much ends up blowing up on him. And uh, this does not sit well with his, like, chief at the police department. And so, because, you know, it's not like, oh, now now my boss is, is on my butt trying yeah. to, you know, because of the thing that you just did, um, he suspends <laughs> Sam. And Twitch, who wasn't even there, suspends him as well because he's like, you're kind of in, tro in control of Sam and keeping him like level-headed, and you weren't there, so you're suspended too. But so they, it's really rough for them uh, until they get a phone call. I think Twitch gets a phone call where an old colleague of his who moved to a different city uh, has a horrible crime that happened, and he's like, I can't really, I need fresh eyes on this. I've been too deep in it. Mm. Uh, and we see the crime scene, and it's pretty horrendous. Uh, and it looks like that is where we're going to be going. I know from future issues it talks about maybe it's even tied in with some of their old cases. Uh, but I thought the dialogue in this was really fun. McFarland has a – it's a like the thing where like you don't know what the kids are talking about, then it turns out they're talking about Mario Kart. Yeah. You know, it's it, there's references. It's kind of over the top, but in a really fun comic book way. The art – uh, at first is, you know, uh, Simone Kudansky. It's very dark. It's very um, kind of gritty. But it works really well for this detective story. So if you like that, if you're familiar with the characters, but even if you kind of like a uh, a detective, like, you know, give me your badge and your gun, you know, you're off the force yeah. type thing, this is great. Your, your butt's writing checks that your mouth can't catch yeah. or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. There's essentially that exact conversation. <laughs> <Nice>. <laughs> But uh, I thought it was great for two ninety nine. You can't beat it. That is Sam and Twitch number one, and you can see up here they've got their new new U. So I guess it's new universe with a little yeah, spawn a little logo spawn. in it. So uh, you'll be seeing more of that. And we have a yeah. The new U doesn't quite make sense, but in the U there's a little spawn yeah. symbol. That <laughs> make that's when it makes sense. Yeah. You read this and you'll feel like a new U. Yeah. Uh, and then we also have the Todd McFarlane variant cover. That was nice. And I know he loves these characters. Yeah. He's always talking about doing a TV show of them and everything. And you can really see in this how much he loves them and how he like really gets their like Laurel and Hardy. Yeah. But if they were grim detectives. I feel like that's his, you know, that's his fetch. Like he's really trying to make fetch happen. You <laughs> yeah. know what I mean? <laughs> Uh, yeah, but they're great though. The fact and the fact that they've stood the test of time. They've been around for thirty years. Yeah, I mean, come they've on. Been around as long as Spawn's been yeah, around. Yeah, for sure. All right, so next for me is uh, Local Man Bad Girl. So this is a one-shot that ties in with the Local Man series from Tim Seeley and Tony Fleeks. Uh, it's a really fun. I really like it quite a bit. 
um, just kind of a you know the nostalgic. Uh, it's a current day story, but also feeds into like '90s image nostalgia. It's really good. It's now, kind of what we were hoping crossover would be. Yeah, because you get crossovers. In oh, these. for sure. Well, yeah, and in this one, you do for sure. Um, so this is one single story. It's a one shot. It's one single story, but we kind of get three different stories in it because it flashes back to three different points in the life of Neon here. We get Neon's origin, which I don't remember if we ever got that before. I'm a few issues behind on this current, on this new story arc, but the first story arc, I don't think we saw that. Um, we get another story about this time when this female villain named the Sixth, as in one, two, three, four, fifth, sixth, um, she made all the men in the world disappear and what the female heroes had to go through to get them back. And that's where you get a lot of your naughty stuff. There's the um, She-Dragon. She-Dragon. Uh, there's all the, the female characters from Cyber Force. And Witchblade's Wildcat. in there. Witchblade is in it. Um, a bunch of them. It's really cool to see them all together. Uh, there's another story about Cross Jack's encounter with a villain named Fright Knight, who um, is uh, Neon's arch nemesis, and what Neon had to do to save him and the repercussions that had on down the line. So just if you're a, a, if a fan of the Local Man series, definitely pick this up because it feeds right into that, but the focus is on Neon and some other things that she did. Uh, I wouldn't recommend starting the Local Man series with this, though, because you'll be really confused. But uh, if you have been reading it, this is a very, very great addition. Uh, just a one-and-done story, but kind of a sneaky way to put in three stories. So it's yeah. really, really good. And this is the only cover I have for this one as well. Yeah, I just love, like... I flipped through it real quick and I was like, oh man, look at all these characters. Yeah. I love seeing these characters in a new book. Yep. Yeah. So it was really, really, really fun. cool. Mm -hmm. Okay. Next up for me is I've got The Goon, Them That Don't Stay Dead, number one of four. It says it right on the cover. Uh, this is uh, one of four. So this is great. Um, if you've never read The Goon, The Goon uh, quickly is a goon. He is a. A uh, strong guy type thing, but he's a good guy. He's like really morally good in in the goon. Even though he he does a lot of punching and stuff, he does what has to be done. He's very Hellboy feeling, mm -hmm. um, with you know his his kind of uh, doesn't say much, but you know can can handle a situation if he needs to. But in this, he's just chilling. Like he's not in the middle of any big. He's kind of. Uh, the town that they're in is full of vampires and werewolves and zombies and mummies. He's got all that down to, you know, a simmer. They're, they're not acting up or anything. Um, but we do see there is a woman who enters, and she almost looks like a girl goon. Like, okay. you, she's like also big and really tough and everything, but she is on the run from something. We don't know what it is. Uh, and she comes into the town... Uh, comes to the bar and there's some great interaction between the goon and her. Uh, she thinks that like he like comes in, he's like, "Oh, is this seat taken?" And she's like, "Are you trying to hit on me?" He's like, "Literally, no. This is the only seat." <laughs> and I thought it would be polite to ask if I can sit here, type thing. It's really funny their interaction, and they they have a really good uh, you know back and forth, uh, being they're very very similar. So that's kind of one of the stories going on which does escalate. But the other story is there's a character, and I've read a lot of Goon, but I haven't... It's so, like, one-and-done stories that I don't remember all the characters. But there is a character in this who they kind of talk as like being the biggest bad in the Goon universe, and he's just referred to as the kid with the duck. And he's literally <laughs> just a little kid uh, holding a dead duck by the neck. And he's very cute-looking. He's got on, like, a little, like, aviation cap. Uh... Just really adorable. But he just wants to kill the goon. Every time he's tried to, he's been thwarted. Uh, he sent mummies after the goon. That didn't work. Uh, so he is going to go to the most evil store in the town that sells a bunch of evil magic things. And he's going to finally get something to take the goon out. And it seems like maybe these two stories are going to start coming together. But uh, I have to read more to see. But... Fantastic. So the art is black and white. Yeah. This is by Eric Powell. Um, don't let it be black and white deter you from it because the art is amazing. The art is amazing. Eric Powell is so good. It's cartoony but detailed mm -hmm. at the same time. Uh, you know, you'll get kind of over the top expressions, but then you'll get just beautifully rendered 
uh, towns and and backgrounds and uh, environments and everything. So uh, even if you've never read The Goon, Goon is always easy to jump into because the character is not super complex. Yeah. So, you know, go back and read the original. There was great collect editions of it. But also if you want something just really, really fun, like almost laugh out loud funny moments in this when it's just so ridiculous, but still kind of in the horror genre. It's very, very weird, very of its, it's one of a kind. Yeah. Um, I recommend picking up Goon, Them That Don't Stay Dead, number one. You will enjoy it. Uh, we also have this variant. This is the Davison variant. Lil Goon. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so next up is Ghostbusters Back in Town, number one. So this uh, this uh, is written by David Boer, and the art is by Blue Delaquanti. And this takes place between Ghostbusters Afterlife, which came out a couple years ago, and Ghostbusters Frozen Empire, which just came out last week. We went and saw it last Thursday night. Mm -hmm. um, so this, this fits right in there. And at the very beginning of the brand new movie, the Spangler family are already in New York, and they're already busting ghosts. And that took me aback just for a, a brief second. I was like, wait a minute. Why they're already? What are they? They're they're in New York, just living there yeah, already. It was just teased in the previous movie, like it showed the firehouse at the end, but it's like they didn't even know about the yeah. firehouse. Well, this book uh, is about them moving to New York. I mean, th w when this starts, they've they're already there, but they had they have just literally just gotten to New York, and most of the book is about them moving there and adjusting to life there, but having a bit rough, a bit of a rough go of it. Um, they do bust one ghost in this, and there's a little tease at the end of some things to come later on for this series, but by and large, the series is mostly just them coming to New York and, um, you know, adjusting to life and, and, and figuring out what they need to do there. Um, so as a standalone Ghostbusters story, it's probably not, you know, the, the best standalone Ghostbusters story, but as a, uh, as a, a companion to these these two new Ghostbusters movies, it, yeah, it works really really well. So if you like these two new ones uh, and you want a little bit more, then definitely pick this up because yeah, it does bridge them together very very well. So we have our A cover right there, and then we have this really cool um, Morris variant with uh, them pulling the uh, Ecto one on a trailer, you know, like you would pull a trailer to to move across state or something. Cool. Next up, I've got Edge of the Spider Verse number two. So this is a really interesting one. You can even see on the cover, Spooky Man. That is our main story in here. So we've got three stories. We got The Spooky Man by Kari Andrews and Bob Quinn. We got Cyborg Spider-Man by Rich Duke and uh, Edgar Salazar. Uh, and also, I'll get to it in a minute, Spider-Man 2099 uh, story that we'll talk about. But uh, to begin with, we've got uh, Spooky Man. This is really fun. This is about a kid named Gloomy. Uh, I do like when they do um, Spider-Man, like, Edge of Spider-Verse stories, but they also, it's kind of all its own thing. Like, it's, you know, his name's not Peter. It's, oh, right, you know, right, It's right, very yeah. separate, mm -hmm. uh, and kind of the world he lived in is very different. This to, uh, story with Gloomy, I don't know if it was intended to look, but, like, this could be a stop-motion animated uh, Corpse Bride, oh, yeah. Nightmare Before Christmas, uh, Paranorman, Something like that, and it would be brilliant. Um, so it's about Gloomy. You can even hear like the Danny Elfman soundtrack mm. in this. Uh, it's great. Um, Gloomy, he's like Peter. He's at a school, but this one is Spider High. And everything in this is like kind of dark and goth and everything. Spider High, um, he's bullied, and they shove him down the stairs in a boiler room. And very a la Gwen Stacy, there's a crack when he hits the bottom. and But oh, wow. he meets a spooky man who is kind of a ghost. Uh, I, I would almost relate him closer to, like, spooky man, closer to a Venom story than a Spider-Man story. Okay. Because it's almost like, imagine the symbiote, but it was a ghost. And it always rhymes. Uh, imbues him with its power... And when his teacher, who is, um, what's his name? Uh, he's a, he's a Doc Ock. Uh, it's like Kraken Puss, I think <laughs> it's his name. Uh, attempts to summon a bunch of spirits, which look like the Sinister Six. 
uh, it's up to Spooky Man to stop them. Uh, I don't want to get into how um, Spooky Man comes about, how Gloomy becomes Spooky Man, but it is pretty horrific anytime he has to turn into him. But uh, he may catch the eye of the red haired girl he has a crush on, okay. who is dating the head bully slash yeah. football player. So that old chestnut. Yeah, that yeah. one's really fun. We also have in here uh, the Cyborg Spider Man story where. Uh, in this one, Cyborg Spider-Man, classic, you know, I think everybody knows that cover. Yeah, with Eric him. Larson yeah, with the that, cyborg arm and the red, the eye. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, he has to fight a cyborg version of the Sinister Six. That's really cool. And then Spider-Man 2099. Now, let me tell you about this. So, when you open the book, uh, there's your page that says, like, you know, tells you what Edge of the Spider-Verse is and then tells you the three stories and the creators. I got to the end. There is no Spider-Man 2099 story on here, even though it says it in the beginning of the book. Yeah, it's got your three stories. You know, story number one, creative team. Story two, creative team. Spider-Man 2099, and creative, creative team. team. And then there's it's not there. <laughs> there's nothing there's there. Nothing there. So I don't know if maybe that was a... I, it's not a printing error. It's a... it's a uh, Planning error. Planning I think, error. Yeah. But uh, sorry if you get to the end and you want a 2099 story because there is not one thing. Yeah. But uh, I thought that was really funny and very odd. Um, so that is that one. We've got some great variants for this one. Speaking of 2099, he does appear on this Pete Woods homage cover to Star Wars. Really cool cover. Uh, we've got a Mark Brooks headshot variant with Spider-Woman, who does not appear in this book. And we have this other, this is the, uh, Andrews, I believe this is Kari Andrews, who writes that first story, uh, variant with Spooky Man, which you get more of that kind of uh, creepy yeah. style. Very cool. Oh, and we've got one more. I've got a, uh, I've got a um, one in twenty-five Ricky Yagawa variant. This is another weird planning thing. So this is the Ricky Yagawa variant. It's a one in twenty-five or something for twenty dollars. We know from the solicitation that the next issue is going to have the, uh, I forgot what they're called, but it's. Uh, kind of the Spider Girl in space. Uh, she's on the cover of this one and not the next issue. So, guess that's her first cover appearance and the issue before her first yeah. appearance. Okay, sure. <laughs> well, next for me is uh, continuing the Spider Man theme. This is Spider Punk Arms Race number two. And after the big fight of the in, in the last issue, the Spider Band is uh, Spider. Yeah, Spider. Yeah, I have Spider Brand. Spider Band <laughs> uh, is sort of regrouping, sort of licking their wounds. Um, uh, they uh, they track where the uh, Spider Slayer that they fought in the last issue, they're able to track where that came from, and they track it directly to Justin Hammer's company. Uh, but when they get there, they find a rhino waiting for them. So we get a really cool fight with the Spider Band and the big rhino on Earth-138. Um, and, you know, Doc Ock, he's working with Justin Hammer. We saw that in the first issue. Well, he gets really fed up with Justin Hammer in this because he thinks he's kind of, a, of an imbecile. And let's just say he decides to change their working arrangement. And that's all I'll say about that. <laughs> but, um, yeah, just more fun. You know, if you like these characters, Spider-Punk and Ms. Marvel and Daredevil and... Uh, shoot, I can't remember Captain America's name. Commander America, maybe? I don't remember. But, uh, yeah, just, just cool, more cool fight scenes with them. And, you know... And, and, and the Doc Ock in this world is pretty, pretty savage, though. So, um, yeah, just another cool issue there. There's our A cover right there. Here is our uh, uh, Mafud cover. And then we have this super duper awesome Ryan Stegman variant. I love that one. Next up for me, I've got Amazing Spider-Man. There's a lot of Spider-Man this time. Uh, this is Amazing Spider-Man number 46. We're getting ever closer to the big issue 50. And in this one, kind of continuation of the last issue where they went to visit uh, Mary Jane's Aunt Anna and Ravencroft. Uh, but in this one, we see the Sinister Six wants to put the Sinister Six back together, but their missing piece, Sandman, is locked up in Ravencroft, where he's done a pretty good job at reforming himself. So they are going to send uh, someone in, you could probably tell by the cover, to mm. extract him. But will he want to go? Meanwhile, uh, Peter and Mary Jane as Spider-Man and Jackpot uh go to try to stop this from happening but maybe it's thanks to aunt anna and some of the inmates that this could be thwarted you'll have to read it to find out but it was a really fun issue uh i like it was kind of a smaller scale 
uh, story that I thought worked really, really well. So really fun issue there with Amazing Spider-Man number 46. We also have the variants for this one. We've got the Mark Brooks headshot variant. And we also have this really nice uh, Martin variant. This is that, uh, what is it? This something Peter Parker, Parker. Parker, Peter Parker's life or something like that. Yeah, yeah. variant. The life of Parker. I the think life of Parker. Well, next one is one of my favorites that I read this week. This is uh, Green Arrow number 10, and this series continues to be phenomenal. So in this one, Amanda Waller, you know, she has tasked Green Arrow with um, retrieving the sanctuary files from Heroes in Crisis. You know, when all the heroes sort of like dumped all their problems into this, into this like sort of AI program. Um, she wants Green Arrow to get those files, and she says that she'll tell him where Roy is if he does that. So Green Arrow and Connor Hawk go to this secret place in the Arctic where the files are stored. And there's a really cool two-page splash of how they get there. It's so cool. Um, but when they get there, and it's not a spoiler because they're right there on the cover, they run into Arrowette and Red Arrow and Speedy and Red Canary. They're there waiting for them. And I don't want to say too much more about this, but there are there's more than one really great... Green Arrow family moments in this. And I feel like that Joshua Williamson is doing a lot of work to to reunite all of the Green Arrow family. Uh, I, I think they could be as prominent in the DC Universe as the Bat family or Bold the Stanley. Flash family. I mean, you know, they they could... I mean, I guess what I mean is like there's a lot of them. There's a lot of them and that haven't been used That haven't been time. used in a long time. And there is a lot of stories that you could tell if you put them all together. Yeah. I, guess that, I guess that's what I mean by that. And I feel... But they've been so disparate for so long and i feel like joshua williamson is doing a lot of work to, to bring them all back together and if you read this you'll see what i mean but um just some cool moments uh there's cool moments with another character not on this cover but i won't spoil that just just super fantastic issue of green arrow if you've been reading this series uh definitely don't miss this because this is just as good as all the other ones so we have our a cover right here and the artwork's great too i mean it's 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 crazy uh and then we have this really nice uh jorge fornes variant as well Next up for me, I've got Rise of the Powers of Ten, number three. Uh, just continuing this storyline, you know, telling the fall of Krakoa era. And in this one, as you can see on the cover, uh, Xavier is going to basically enact his plan to take out Myra. But you see her here, older. No, he's going back to before she got her powers, which she was very young when she got them. Will Xavier stoop that low? Uh, in order to save the future. You'll have to read to find out, but uh, very interesting. Is there any other way uh, than this horrible act he would have to do? You'll have to read it, but uh, I thought it was a pretty good issue. So just continuing the story, and I believe a lot of these stories are going to be merging coming up mm. uh, between the uh, the two that are going on. I mean, it's so, getting near the end, so yeah. yeah. Yeah, so we got our A cover right there. We also have this... Really nice Mark Brooks variant with Gambit. We've got a toothpick in his mouth. Yep. And we've got this uh, Harvey variant. No, that's X-Men 97. That's X-Men 97. <laughs> so we only have the one. Yep. <laughs> well, way to go from an X-Men book to an X-Men book, and it's like, oh, it just looks yeah, the same. Yeah, it just looks the same, yeah. Well, uh, next for me is Miles Morales, Spider-Man number 18. But we wanted to spotlight this one because this is Legacy number 300. Now, I will say... This is an $8.99 book, but it is very oversized, mm -hmm. and it's all one story. So normally in books like this, you expect a main story and then a backup story, maybe a reprint or something like that. This entire book is all just one big story from start to end, uh, which is part two. Uh, they, the, this story arc kicked off last issue, and this is just the continuation of it. Um, this, and it's not the end of this story arc either, but it does kind of feel like the final showdown between Spider-Man and his allies like uh, Miss Marvel and Prowler and those guys. Uh, it feels like a showdown between them and the Cape Killers and Rabble, who have sort of teamed up. And Rabble has given the Cape Killers some tech upgrades. And this is a very action-packed issue because these two groups just slug it out mm -hmm. for the longest time in this book. Uh, we do see Spider-Man uh, displaying maybe some type of power upgrade in this that he hasn't really done before. So that was really cool to see. Just a big, massive issue of Miles Morales, uh, Spider-Man number 18. Now, I will say, uh, as I was reading this, there are maybe four to five pages where there was some kind of printing error. 
Uh, the the print is is faded out. There's some weird like blobs on it or something yeah, like some that. Yeah, some weird thing that happened with the ink. Something happened with the ink. Yeah, it's just it's really weird. It's, and it's on a lot of the A covers. At least all the ones we checked had this error. Yeah. And it could be you never know how far reaching, but it's more than our store because of course there's no way it just would have been yeah. us that got the so, bags. Yeah. Uh, be on the lookout for that. Yeah, but uh, on the variants, we've like I flipped through this one, and it is not present in at least this variant that I checked. So, you know, if you're gonna walk in, maybe pick up a variant instead, or maybe like look through it and see. Um, like I said, it's it's an oversized issue, and it's only on about four pages, so it doesn't really take you. One of them's like an ad. So. Yeah, and one's an ad, so it doesn't hurt that much. But just wanted to let you know. But it's not on it's not on this variant anyway, which is by David Marquez. That's very cool. And then we have this super duper awesome 1 in 25 Kari Andrews variant that we're selling for $50. Although uh, Peter and Gwen are not in this. So, but, Spider-Ham? And Spider-Ham's not in it oh. either. But that's a super cool cover. Yeah. Okay, lastly for me, I just want to mention, I'm not going to go into the story details, but our final issue of Somna came out. Because it's the final issue, I don't want to give away any of the spoilers. How does this end up? But uh, great final issue. Very, I don't want to say unexpected ending, but... You know, super cool. Uh, so don't miss out on that one. But it does tell in the begin in in if in, in the end of it, not the beginning, at the end of it, that there is a hardcover coming soon. Okay. So uh, maybe you can you know want to grab that as well. But definitely pick up the issues because they are great. Uh, so we've got our A cover by Becky Cloonan. We have our polybagged variant by Tula Lote. We've got our. Tula Lote regular cover. And then we've got a 1 in 10 uh, Emma Rios variant that we're selling for $15. And then we have this really nice uh, Citria uh, 125 variant that we're selling for $40. And I just wanted to show this real quick. This is Harley Quinn number 38. This is the uh, Women's History Month variant by uh, uh, Sosa Mica. Just I didn't read this one, but we got a, a few of these, and these covers just look so good. Harley Quinn, kind of in a cowgirl dress up. Uh, it's a little like it looks like Margot Robbie, but it's a little uh, Harley Quinn meets Barbie. Yeah, uh, w yeah. We, so we just wanted to show you that one in case you're you know you like Harley, cool Harley Quinn covers. That one is a very very cool one, so it would be a great addition to your Harley Quinn collection. And that is it. There was a lot of stuff to mm -hmm. talk about this week, but thanks for sticking with us. Leave us an emoji of a cat. Yes. Oh, for Feral, for sure. Yeah, yeah that's a, a big cat, one. A cat, because that that's a big one this week. Uh, leave us that in the comments so we know that you made it to the end of the show. Remember to like, subscribe, do all that great stuff as we inch ever closer to 3,000 followers. We really, really appreciate every single one of you that does that. Leave us a comment. We love to answer those, ask questions, all that good stuff. Uh, head over to infinityflux.net where you can order the books that we just talked about while supplies last, plus tons of other stuff that's oh, yeah. on there. There's, oh, yeah. You can dig for days mm -hmm. through our inventory. Uh, and stay tuned for our show coming up on Wednesday. Where we'll be going over the books that you can pre-order by this weekend so you don't miss out on any of the comic goodness. And unless you have anything to add. What? You don't? Okay. No. <laughs> <laughs> we will see y'all next time. See ya.